Hello there, we're here with Hudson River naturalist Tom Lake. Tom, good hey, to Chris. see you. Hey Chris, good to see you too. Tom uh, is, has been a fantastic mentor of mine and he is just uh, an, a, an absolute font of knowledge when it comes to the Hudson River. Not just the Hudson River today as we see it, but the Hudson River of the past as well. And uh, you've got a great <clears throat> assortment of, of, of things here to take a look at and, and if I could just pick on one thing to start sure, with. Sure, sure. One of the things that really catches my eye is, is this point right here. Could you tell us a little bit about this point? Well, this is a, what we call a projectile point. Uh, this was made by somebody over in Greene County at a place called Flint Mine Hill, probably about 12,000 years ago. Uh, these were some of the first people to come to the Hudson Valley. We call them Paleo in Indians. Um, and we're not exactly sure what this was used for, probably for hunting purposes for the most part. Uh, but it's emblematic of these first people. Um, it's, it's type of the point it is, is called a Clovis point. Um, and it is emblematic of the first people who came here to the Hudson Valley. And part of the science on the Hudson River today is not only the here and now science, but also what has transpired in, in the past. And the display that we've had here today, the talk we gave here today, talks about the past because everything we see out there today, all the biology that we're studying today on the river, uh, is the sum of what's transpired on the river in the last 20,000 years. 20,000 years ago, there was almost two miles of ice overhead and nobody wow. was home. <laughs> nobody was home. <laughs> so everything we see today has has come in that interim period in the last 20,000 years. And Native people, including the very first people, the Paleo-Indians, are certainly some of those. Um, we can learn a lot about studying the past. Uh, paleontology, archaeology, sciences that study the past. Um, one of the major focuses right now on the past that is relevant to the future is this concept of climate change. Yeah. Um, we went through a climate change episode here in the Hudson Valley somewhere around 12 or 13,000 years ago. Uh, some forms of, of life that were here in the Hudson Valley at that time uh, were forced to move their range to more northern latitudes to survive. Other types of life were unable to adapt and they went extinct, animals mm -hmm. like mastodons and mammoths. Uh, so studying the effects of climate change on life and whether adaptations occur or they do not is relevant today because in worldwide locations today, uh, life on Earth is again going through climate change and we'll be able to see the kinds of effects that's going on with life here today. One of the things that's amazing to me is that, that climate change of, of I think you said 12 or 13,000 yeah. years ago, when those glaciers receded, it was kind of like a gigantic <clears throat> reset button for Hudson River ecology? It's, it, you know, in, in ecology we call it natural succession. Um, natural succession is as climate changes, we first get um, a tundra environment, then a park tundra, um, and then we get pioneer plants uh, and a little more complex types of plants, and eventually you get, you get uh, coniferous trees, and eventually you get deciduous trees. Uh, and it's that um, natural succession of plant life that eventually led to conditions conducive to humans being here in the Hudson Valley. Far earlier than that, it was conducive to things like mammoths and mastodons. Mammoths and mastodons love eating spruce and hemlock and balsam fir. People needed deciduous trees, uh, nut-bearing trees, because along with those came chipmunks and squirrels and white-tailed deer, the kinds of forage that would support humans. You've mentioned mastodons a couple times, and I think you have a couple of pieces of evidence. Yeah, we, I often tell my students um, that there were herds of elephants uh, running around Dutchess County, and uh, they look at me like I'm putting them on, but the fact of the matter is it's true. There were, there were herds of elephants. Uh, this is the tooth of a mastodon. Um, this was the most common form of now extinct elephant that lived in the Hudson Valley. The other uh, elephant was called a mammoth, and this is the tooth of a mammoth. Um, you can tell a lot from their, from their teeth. Um, without even doing any pollen analysis to figure out what kinds of what kind of what the ecology was of this area, uh, you look at the teeth. These are the ones that are found almost exclusively. These guys are browsers. They've got cusps on their teeth like white-tailed deer. These guys are woodland uh, creatures. And so when we find a predominance of these mastodons in, say, Dutchess County, we can be pretty well assured that 12,000 years ago, this was a woodland area. On the other hand, mammoths have teeth, um, and these guys, are, um, these guys are grazers, and they need grasslands. Wow, and the grasslands 12,000 years ago were find, found along the coast, the continental shelf. 
uh, around the Great Lakes. There were a lot of grasslands. These are teeth that are conducive to grazing on grasses. You'd have a similar tooth. Here's another tooth right here. And these teeth would move together oh, wow. to be able to digest, well, uh, eat and, and digest plant material. Um, whereas the mastodon would simply go and nip off branches of hemlock and spruce and all those kinds of, uh, of trees. Now, this right here, is this, a, is this an actual fossil where the organic material has been replaced by stone? Or is this an actual, or is this the original tooth? The, you know, these are only 12,000 years old, and so these are still fossilized, but they're not mineralized. Gotcha. Uh, the best example of mineralization is petrified wood, where you've actually had an organic piece of wood where the cells have been replaced by minerals that are in water. Uh, no, these are actually organic. We could actually do radio, and we have radiocarbon wow. dating on this. Uh, with a tooth, you can do amazing things. You can do isotope analysis on the teeth to figure out what the diet of this animal was. You could do um, electron microscope scanning to count the growth rings on the teeth to find out how old this animal was. These guys were big. They were 10 feet high at the shoulder, and they weighed 10,000 pounds. And so when I put this image in students' minds of a herd of elephants running around the landscape of that size, uh, that's a pretty amazing image in somebody's mind. We don't have anything like that today, so it's quite an evocative idea. Is it possible or likely that the, the, the people who put this, this Clovis point mm -hmm. together were interacting with the, we think the so. mammoths that were here? We think so. Um, Mammoths and mastodons went extinct. They, they failed this adaptation test somewhere between 10,500 and 12,000 years ago, somewhere in there. Um, the first people came to the Hudson Valley between 11,000 and, say, 13,000 years ago. There was at least 1,000 years overlap between the first people arriving and mammoths and mastodons still being here. But like trains in the night, they were passing on the landscape. Mammoths and mastodons were heading to oblivion, and humans were, at, were heading to dominance of the landscape. Um, there's no evidence... Um, to support any contention that native people were hunting these animals. We have found no kill sites at all east of the Mississippi. West of the Mississippi, there have been some. East of the Mississippi, there are no kill sites for mammoths and mastodons. And as I tell students, if you had an opportunity to go kill a 10,000 pound animal, you know, or go fishing, or go, or go collect berries, you know, you probably would do the latter. I mean, you're not gonna mess with these animals that had probably a very nasty disposition. So there really was no active hunting. These guys went extinct. Uh, and humans flourished for the very same reason. They were, you know, humans have been these, 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 these wonderful adapters to environment. Mm -hmm. um, everything from skin color to body type. Um, and so climate change has not been an issue for humans on the face of the earth. But other forms of life have not been as, as fortunate. And so these guys went extinct for the very reason that humans came to flourish here in the Hudson Valley. These, are, by the way, are not arrowheads. Here is a Jack's Reef uh, spear point. Uh, these are all spear points. This one dates to about 8,700. Um, these are spear points because the bow and arrow did not come to the Hudson Valley as new technology until about AD 750, AD 800, oh. somewhere in there. Until then, it was something that was known in the Midwest. It was something that was known in the Far West, but it had not worked its way here in the East. Uh -huh. um, we had learned domestication of plants. We had learned ceramics and pottery, but the bow and arrow was one of the last pieces of technology to come to the east. So we don't see real true arrowheads until about a thousand years ago, maybe 1200 years ago. Then we begin to see these very small little triangular points that are truly arrowheads. Before that, we didn't. A couple of the other kinds of uh, artifacts that are here, we see a lot of these in the Hudson. These are adzes. Usually there's some kind of metamorphic rock. These are actually are made of basalt. This is the material that the Palisades is made out of. They would use these to fashion their dugout canoes. Oh. In this part of the Northeast, we did not have birch bark canoes. We had dugout canoes because the paper birch was not common enough around here at that time. So they would take a, a big log and they would start fires inside the log and then put the fire out and then dig out the charred wood that had burned, and then they start another fire, and eventually they'd work their way down and hollow out the inside of that log, and they'd have a dugout canoe. So these adzes were actually used, it was a hand adze, it was actually used to make dugout canoes. And they were, they, now those tools they would keep because one of these would probably take somebody uh, maybe a full day, maybe a couple of days to actually make one of these. So there'd be enough effort in this, they would not throw this away like they would the net sinkers. They would hang on to this and use it over again. I think it's, a, it's an amazing perspective to see this variety of tools because 
few, several years back, uh, there, was, there was a lot of celebrations in the Hudson River about the 400 year anniversary yeah. of Henry Hudson and the, the sort of the opening of European exploration. Yeah. And it's interesting to think, all right, that was 400 years ago, but it's interesting to remember that there wasn't just one culture, there was a multitude of cultures yeah. here for thousands right. of years. Yeah, we had we evolving had this, and growing. We had this quadricentennial of Henry Hudson, and uh, from a native person's perspective, when Henry Hudson showed up, the train went off the tracks. Yeah, they'd never been the same since. When Henry Hudson sailed up the river, a lot of the a lot of the notoriety that went with that, a lot of the advertisement with that, was that they were bringing civilization to the Hudson Valley. They were bringing all these wonderful things. The fact of the matter is, when Hudson sailed up the river in 1609, there had already been 424 generations of people. 424 generations of people had lived along the Hudson River before Henry Hudson arrived. And so any notion that the people living here did not know who they were, they did not have any, any, any kind of a cosmology or worldview, that was one of the arguments. They didn't know who they were, they had no history, because they did not have a written language. They had an oral language, they told stories, that's how they knew who they were. Uh, it worked well for them. In fact, most tribal people do that around the world even today. Tribal peoples don't necessarily have a written language, they have an oral language. Uh, but that was held against the native people here, and it was, it was believed these people don't know who they are, they don't have a past, but they did, they very much did. Uh, here are pieces of sturgeon uh, that were uh, recovered at a site near Bard College that date to about AD 750. There's, we have lots more of these, these are just a few that I put in here. Here are modern day sturgeon uh, remains. These are not bones, by the way, these are cartilaginous. Uh, sturgeon, like shark, skates, and rays, are cartilaginous fishes. This is not a bone, this is actually cartilage. This is the piece of a, a sturgeon as well. Um, but native people were harvesting sturgeon out of the Hudson River. They were harvesting longhorn sculpin out of the river um, a thousand years ago, uh, the same as we have been doing in recent times. They may have been able to temper their enthusiasm a little bit more because apparently they did not deplete the stocks as we've been doing. Sure. Here's some old oyster shells. We used to have giant oysters in the Hudson 6,000 years ago. Well, here's a giant oyster. Conditions in the Hudson 6,000 years ago were absolutely optimal for the growth of oysters. The balance of freshwater salinity, nutrients in the water, um, sedimentation, all of those factors that go into a healthy oyster population were here for maybe a thousand years, maybe from 6,000 to about 7,000 years ago. Um, and then afterwards, um, especially when the Europeans showed up, the river got a lot more silty, conditions weren't quite as good, and so oysters began to get smaller. These are actually prehistoric as well. These are about 3,000 years old. They're considerably smaller. We're not exactly sure. Whatever that wonderful balance that we had in the river that allowed oysters to become giant oysters passed. Uh -huh. And we still had a lots of healthy oysters in the river, but they just were not quite as big. The growing season yeah. conditions were just not quite as good for them. It's, it's safe to say that, you know, we talk about climate change today. And there are some, there are some real and genuine concerns about that. But climate change has been a right. part of the Hudson Valley, a part of, of our planet for a long, long time. It has. And, and most of the previous climate changes can be traced to natural occurrences. Sure. And the one we're looking at today, most scientists simply believe has to do with fossil, um, with, uh, fossil fuels and green, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Right. Uh, and that seems to be, in this particular instance anyway, man-induced. So. It's amazing to think that you know, now we, we, we often talk about the resurgence of the Hudson River the, 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 and the complexities around that resurgence and, and sure. the way we love our river or care for our river or now paying more attention to our river. And I just love the perspective of thinking back a thousand or six thousand or twelve thousand years ago, where communities really were in touch with the river. Oh, I mean, they this, were connected. This is this yeah. is not a new idea. This yeah. river has been a big part of the people of what we call New York. You know, for even thousands of years. even in historic times, uh, when 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 this country was very young, people were connected to the river. But very quickly, as we overpopulated, and we uh, the term is actually exceeding carrying capacity. Native mm -hmm. people lived in this Hudson Valley for a long time. And it appears, at least from the analysis that's been done, that they did not exceed carrying capacity. They, they never seemed to have too many people in an area that the resources could not support.
support. Um, we have certainly, since uh, Europeans showed up in this Northeast, we have certainly been doing our best to exceed carrying capacity. And that's what puts the pressure on the resources that are available. Um, people like to think the native people were uh, these great care caretakers of the land. They were, but I'm not so sure it was conscious. I, I think it was just a, a, a natural response to this idea of what the of what the river can support, what the land can support, and they just kind of naturally gravitated towards uh, having that that existence. Today, we just we just don't do that. We test the boundaries all the time. Tom, we're really lucky to have people like you to help us understand this greater picture and this greater history. And I just my pleasure, Chris. Thank you very much. My pleasure. All right, awesome.